<laughs> Welcome to uh, everyone who is joining us today for this panel, Transformative Justice and its Implications for College Campuses, with Mimi Kim and Sir Circes Mendes. I am Araceli Esparza, an associate uh, professor in the English department at CSULB and a member of the CSU Abolition Network. Today's talk was organized by the CSU Abolition Network and is part of the CSU Abolition Network Understanding Abolition Speaker Series that aims to provide a critical understanding of abolition as a practice that calls for the dismantling of policing, mass incarceration, and other institutions that lead to the premature death of vulnerable populations, including Black, Brown, and Indigenous people, people with disabilities, LGBTQIA people, and poor people. Abolitionist organizing seeks to create life-enabling conditions for all, following the log lo a logic best expressed by Ruth Wilson Gilmore in the line, where life is precious, life is precious. As we insist on the preciousness of life, we seek to create conditions of mutual and collective care that allow us to avoid calling on the police when harm happens and to uh, insist on state services that do not perpetrate violence. Today's panel seeks to provide strategies for addressing harm on college campuses through a transformative justice approach that refuses police involvement. It is critical to recognize that university police did not always exist on our campuses. As Akila Anant and Priscilla Leva point out in their article, Policing the People's University, the precarity of, of sanctuary in the uh, California State University system, CSU campuses did not ha have police, campus police until the early 1970s, when Chancellor Glenn Dunkey and the CSU Board of Trustees responded to the 1968-1969 San Francisco State student strike, which was led by the Black Student Union and the Third World Liberation Front, first by using racializing and criminalizing language, calling the protesters disrespectful thugs and rioters, and then by calling on armed city police to shut down the strike. Anant and Leva note that in 1972, Chancellor Dumke created a position for a CSU director of security and campus security guards became peace officers with the same duties as city police. Further entrenching police on CSU campus, campuses, in 1975, Dumke announced Executive Order 226 requiring CSU officers to be armed which students largely opposed, noting the racial tensions between police and people of color. Dumke was focused on preventing what he called willful minorities from manipulating an educational institutions, suggesting that campus police were established at least in part precisely to police students of color who were seen as not only outsiders, but as a threat to educational institutions. This framing is even more concerning in the current moment where students of color are a plurality, if not the majority of students on, at most CSU campuses. Further institu institutionalizing policing on our campuses in 1976, California Education Code 89560 declared, quote, the trustees may appoint one or more persons to constitute a police department for the headquarters and for each campus of the California State University. Persons employed and compensated as members of a California State University Police Department when so appointed and duly sworn are peace officers. Similarly, in 1976, California Education Code 92600 authorized the UC Regents to create police departments on UC campuses. I provide this brief overview because today campus police are normalized to such an extent that many people have a difficult time imagining campuses without police. Faculty are often instructed to call campus police when a student is having a mental health crisis or in other similar situations, where an armed response is not only unnecessary, but also exacerbates the vulnerability of already vulnerable pe populations, including people of color, undocumented people, and people with mental health conditions. Police departments have not always been part of CSU campuses, and today's panelists provide a vision for addressing harm and violence on university campuses without relying on the police, providing, providing an opening to imagine that getting um, law enforcement off campuses is possible. Our first panelist, Dr. Mimi, Mimi Kim, is the founder of Creative Interventions and a founder of Insight, Women of Color Against Violence. She has been a long, uh, been a longtime activist, advocate, and researcher challenging gender-based violence 
at its intersection with state violence and creating community accountability, transformative justice, and other community-based alternatives to criminalization. Dr. Kim is an associate professor of social work at California State University, Long Beach. Her recent publications include The Carceral Creed and From Carceral Feminisms to Transformative Justice. Today, Dr. Kim will provide an, an overview of transformative justice, its history over the past 20 years, and the promise and limitations of transformative justice in the era of Me Too and Defund the Police. She will also offer distinctions between, between transformative justice and restorative justice, along with their implications given the rising interest in anti-carceral or abolitionist alternatives. Our second panelist, Circes Mendes, is vice chair and associate professor in women and gender studies and queer studies and affiliated faculty of African American studies at CSU Fullerton. She is a popular educator, organizer, decolonial feminist philosopher, and the founder of the Campus Transformative Justice Project, a project committed to abolitionist and intersectional approaches to addressing sexual assault and gender-based violence in universities and institutions of higher education. A founding member of the Lansing TJ Collective, Dr. Mendes is the Boricua child of factory workers, and a bruja by ancestry, who lives to inspire the next generation of troublemakers and believers that a better world is possible, right? <laughs> Her recent publications include Beyond Nasser, A Transformative Justice and Decolonial Feminist Approach to Campus Sexual Assault, and the Decolonial, uh, and Decolonial Feminist Movidas, A Caribeña Rethinks Privilege, The Wages of Gender, and Building Complex Coalitions. Today, Dr. Mendes will discuss abolition in the context of campus sexual assault and calls to defund the police, particularly campus police. She will speak to the question, how should we be thinking about the relationship between them and the demand to find life-affirming ways to address gender-based violence? After their presentations, we will have time for Q&A and the audience is encouraged to use the Q&A box, not the chat, to post questions. And without further delay, uh, we will now go to Dr. Kim. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Araceli. Um, and thank you so much to the CSU uh, Abolition Network and the Long Beach chapter for inviting me today and um, heading off this uh, exciting series. Um, I'm also really excited because I get to co-present with um, my comrade, my colleague, my dear friend, Circes Mendez. Um, and uh, it's really a pleasure to be able to do that and you know, think about this as we were preparing here that I get to actually talk about the things I've been working on and passionate about within the campus setting. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit as to perhaps some of the structural reasons why, but also I, I Um, as some of you may know, I'm, thank you Araceli for um, sharing some background, but uh, some of you know me, some of you don't, but I've been working on this uh, project that we now call transformative justice for the past 20 years, probably longer, and probably this is a legacy of the, war, um, the, the longstanding work and struggles of my people. I'm Korean American, and we have a long history of struggle against um, Japanese occupation and US occupation in that land um, and my own family's personal struggles with gender-based violence. So those I think all come together in terms of um, inspiring and influencing my work today. Um, I have been working on this for 20 years with the founding of Insight. Some of you might be familiar, I know many of you will not be. Um, this is a social movement organization that started um, in 2000, which is now 20 years ago. Um, Insight came together from uh, radical feminists of color, most of whom at that time had been part of the anti-violence movement working on sexual assault or domestic violence kind of sectors and really had been frustrated with the kind of um, what we didn't call at that carceral feminism, but we now know is carceral feminism that had been driven by primarily um, the white dominant um, feminist movement, um, but that what we that we were part of. 
So um, Insight was a spark for people of color organizing at the intersection of gender-based violence and state violence. Um, it's a space where those of us who have been with peripheries of the feminist anti-violence movement finally got to place ourselves at the center of our organizing and where we took our vastly different and diverse intersectional perspectives as people of color, um, diverse intersectional bodies, spirits, passions, our communities, our legacies and our activism and place that at the center of our fight against oppression and for liberation. Um, I went on from that time when we had an opening to really uh, center, I think our politic and our co conceptual framework um, to think about how to put this politics into practice. Um, for me, having worked in the anti-violence movement for a long time, I searched for examples and sites where people were practicing ways of addressing violence, um, gender-based violence and other forms of interpersonal and community violence that were aligned with our, um, our own cultures or a sense of what we wanted our culture to be, um, that were aligned with our politics of liberation, and that would actually be a, a politic that could be sustainable on the ground. Um, implementation has been something that I've been very passionate about. I think that we can have the most beautiful kind of political concepts, but if we can't actually make that real, real today, now, and in the future, then that is really important work that we need to do. Um, for me, um, I took this work and started an organization called Creative Interventions. Um, that started in 2004 in Oakland, California. And that was at the beginning with, for those of you who are familiar now with transformative justice, we've been around for quite a while, but at that time it was, there were a few different um, organizations that were starting to do uh, our own experiments on the ground, see what this could look like. Um, we took our inspirations from our own families, our own stories, and tried to see how we could make that more systematic. Um, so that's the work that I have done since that time. That's the work that brings me to this very talk today, because I see this talk today as part of this work. It's not just a presentation, but this is the political work that we're doing, and that I'm so happy that I get to do now for my own campus that I've been a part of since 2014. So the question, I think, an important question is, how do we make liberation real in our lives today? How do we practice what we see sometimes as aspirational or future-oriented in our everyday lives today? So for me, I found the, these answers in our loose-knit autonomous community structures. Um, for some of you, you're familiar with what Mia Mingus and the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective have called pods. We certainly hear about pods everywhere now in our uh, COVID times, but um, some of us just might call my people or my friends, my family, my community. Um, and if you're not sure what who those people are, then this is part of the work of transformative justice is building these spaces, building these communities. Um, I found my own work uh, in the space of creative interventions um, in the form at first of a nonprofit organization that I saw as a temporary space for leveraging resources and leveraging new possibilities. Um, at that time, we intentionally set the organizational form to be time limited, to avoid what we imagine to be potential legal entanglements, um, but also to, uh, to sustain ourselves in a way that um, wouldn't take us into a future where we would feel like we had to compromise our politics just in order to say, sustain our own organization. So it was time limited. And um, you can look at our site at creative-interventions.org to see some of the products that we have maintained till today. But in finding myself in a university setting as my primary work setting is something that happened in 2014, you know, six years ago. Um, and this is uh, landing at Cal State Long Beach in the School of Social Work was my first opportunity to work as a professor within the institution of higher learning. Um, and I have to say, admittedly, this has not been the site of liberation. And yet, I think the struggle today is to see this, how this is a site of possibility. And so I'm very excited about this opportunity and actually having a collective of people to imagine this and work towards this together. I don't think that's something that we haven't had in the kind of the large numbers that we have today. And so happy to see that there's quite a few of you 
just in this webinar, I know have been, you've been part of this ongoing work that um, really took off since the summer. Um, <clears throat> so for me, I, I know that up to this point, I've really struggled to make my own classroom the site of, of small possibilities of liberation. Um, within my own school of social work, I've had the opportunity to work together with a small group and growing group of my colleagues, my st staff, uh, faculty and um, students that have been collectively organizing to center critical race theory within um, the practice of our school and within the curriculum of our school. And that's been the kind of organizing work that I've been engaged in. Um, but for the larger university institution, I have actually found this to be a labyrinth, a series of legal and bureaucratic entrapments of no, cannot do. <laughs> This cannot be done for this reason, for that reason. Um, and yet we're here today, um, I think in a different kind of political setting that we, than uh, conditions than we've seen ourselves in the past. So um, as we all know, we have all experienced um, the summer of 2020 together. The field of possibility has changed for all of us. The opportunity may be fleeting, um, and certainly in the, as we can see, the forces of status quo, wherever they are, have established barriers to our progress. They've been there established for, for many, many decades um, and are quickly working to identify and close those opportunities um, and where we have escaped this sort of machinery of the carceral state. Um, this summer, our own students of social work uh, demanded more and I have to say that for one who's been um, now entering my seventh year here at the university, I have not seen that kind of activism among our social work students before. It's been really an exciting force for change. Um, as I said, uh, there were several of us that had been slowly organizing to institutionalize um, critical race theory and all of that 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 means within our school of social work. Um, and yet this opportunity this summer and the demands of our students have, have opened that up and um, uh, uh, created opportunities for progress that we would not have seen otherwise. And I can't say that I, 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 I have been so excited about these kinds of collaborations and the energy of our students. Um, the defund the police movement has of course its roots in uh, slave insurrections um, and leading up to the demands made this summer and that is obviously has opened up a whole nother set of oppor opportunities on the campus and within so many different kinds of um, geographic sites throughout this country. Um, I just wanna spend a little time talking about social work more, more now. It's something that I haven't had the opportunity to do before very much until very, very recently, but it sparked um, all of the Defund the Police movement has sparked a national conversation that many of us been engaged in uh, for years, but at the peripheries of our work, we have not been front and center. And yet, um, as some of you know, there have been calls to def defund the police and turn to social workers. Um, this, these kinds of demands have set off a really heated and more importantly, um, a public debate over the wisdom of turning to social workers given our history of collaboration with the police and with white supremacist um, ideologies and practices that have um, uh, sadly been a very central to our uh, to social work and the development of social work in the United States. Um, for my social work policy class, this became um, essential to our curriculum and really um, wonderful discussions that we've had in the classroom. But also, I, I think some of these discussions also lead us to questions that we're uh, facing today around defunding the police. Um, within, within campuses, and I want to kind of bring some of those conversations to bear. The conversations that are happening within um, police departments and within uh, engagement with city council, um, what does that have to bear in terms of our conversations right now in our action and activities um, on campus? Uh, the director of our school social work this summer signed a very bold statement along with all of the other directors of California schools of social work or departments of social work supporting the Black Lives Matter um, platform. Um, other social workers um, across the country, um, whether they're uh, people that have been part of grassroots kind of social work entities or, or more academic, um, academically embedded 
social work institutions have called for defunding the police and for a radical turn in what some have called anti-carceral or abolitionist social work, um, a term that existed before but now has um, taken on new life. So now we have all these blogs, we have webinars like the one we have today, we have opinion pieces that simply did not exist before June that have been um, forwarding a critique of social work uh, embeddedness within the carceral state. And um, I just wanna say that a few of us uh, penned um, an, an, a journal article very quickly because we wanted to put something out there um, and it just, got accepted for publication. So um, I don't have access to the chat, but it's called Defund the Police Moving Towards an Anti-Carceral Social Work. And hopefully if you Google it, you will find it. So that brings us today. to today. Um, I want to open up um, with a little bit more formal presentation with some historical background, which I think very much a parallels some of the uh, background of the institution of policing within campuses that um, Araceli introduced us to um, at the beginning of this uh, webinar. And um, this is a very history light because we don't have very much time. And I wanna make sure that we have time to focus on the here and now. But I, I think uh, looking historically reminds us um, that despite the rapidity and the urgency of the summer's uprising, that this moment has been many years, decades, centuries in the making. Um, that we really uh, must learn from history's lessons. Um, it looking historically reminds us this is long haul work doing this for at least 20 years. And, um, and yet every day I learn something new. And, um, and this is work that in talking about campuses, we're also trying to fit into an institution with semester long and academic year long cycles that are not our usual cycles of life. So uh, that this work requires forward thinking strategy and long-term uh, relationship building that campuses generally do not foster. So that's some of what I'm, uh, that's, those are some of the challenges I think the campus uh, creates, but I think some of the challenges that um, I will talk about a little bit, but I know that uh, Circes Mendez has done just an incredible amount of work with in looking at the possibilities of um, liberation on campuses. So I'm going to um, turn to a PowerPoint and I just have a few slides I'm going to share here. Um, this is, oh, we just move to the next slide. Um, this is a brief anti-violence movement timeline. And um, of course, there's so many dates on here, so I'm not gonna go through it all. I just want to give you a sense of the breadth of a kind of a more contemporary time period, which very much, again, parallels what Araceli was talking about of the um, institutionalization of the police on campuses in the 1970s. You see that there is also the beginning of, uh, of uh, the, what is called the punitive ter punitive turn. So I'm going to turn you to um, this juxtaposition of a graph that many of you are familiar with, but this is the U.S. rates of incarceration. So what we have in the U.S. rates of incarceration is a punitive turn that started in 1973, that before that we had relatively stable and low rates of incarceration going back all the way to the time when um, these this data was collected, which is from the 1920s. And we have this turn to a five-fold increase in rates of incarceration since 1973. What, um, what I also found interesting was that uh, the history of the contemporary anti-violence movement or um, feminist anti-violence movement also started in around 1973. And so that the development of uh, feminist anti-violence logic, institutions, practices, very much parallel the timing of the buildup of the carceral state. So perhaps it's no, no, not um, surprising that we have a history that uh, parallels kind of the buildup of carceral practices. Um, just very quickly in black, I highlighted some of the um, kinds of 
moments and organizations that I think have been very important to this present moment of what some people are calling, um, we, we, have, we now have something called abolitionist social work. Um, we have abolitionist or abolition feminism. Um, I, I just have to say the uh, Kimberly Crenshaw's work on intersectionality starting in 1989 was very, very important to this. Um, I'm just gonna point out, well, Insight in 2000, um, but I, I'll, in talking to um, Circes in preparation for this, uh, I recall that when we met, we met each other in 2014, right in Long Beach, and found out that we had been in New York at the same time doing some really early work on creating abolitionist spaces. New York Harm Free Zone um, was work that I was doing in 2002 when I was in New York. Um, and we were trying to build, like, thinking about small geographic spaces of four blocks, four square blocks, where we could think of a place where we could have um, responses to um, interpersonal and community violence that would not involve the police. That's 2002, we're now in 2020. This has been work that's been going on for a long time, even though for some of us, we're only starting to imagine it. Um, and it's work that's very difficult. Uh, creative Interventions 2004, but many other small organizations grassroots in grassroots spaces were starting to do the work that we now call transformative justice. Um, and um, be, the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective started in 2011. You see uh, Black Lives Matter starting in 2012 here. So there has been, um, I think, a buildup of uh, abolitionist responses that have started, of course, before this timeline um, starts in, in the 1970s, but there's been a buildup, I'd say, with, um, the, I wanna mark the point of the critical founding of critical resistance in 1998. Um, I'm gonna move on to show that some of the work that I did um, as I went back to school was to have a better, I had the critique, I was doing the practice when I wanted a better understanding of how it was that we had an actual feminist movement that was anti-police, that was anti-military, that was social justice, that was a liberatory movement. How is it that this movement got so engaged with law enforcement? That was the question that I had. And I think some of the answers to this question that at least that I found are kind of uh, cautionary tales about what we might engage in now. So if we think about um, a lot of the work of social movements being placed within civil society, let's say out of the state, um, and, and that actually there was a target was social, of the social movement was the state, um, that we see that over time, what we ended up with was kind of a um, embeddedness, a hybridization of social movements that have been contesting the state together with the state. And you know, I could go on and do a very long talk on this, but I'm going to try to really reduce it to some of the elements um, that hopefully makes sense to you, um, even with a, this short introduction. Um, I usually use this in talking about the anti-violence movement. Here I'm thinking about some of the questions we have in social work. How is it that, you know, if we're called on or we're social workers are gonna ride along with the police, let's say, to soften the police, to take away the, the sharp edge of the carceral state. How are those calls then seen uh, bringing social workers into an embeddedness within law enforcement? How do we win that? That's not a win for social work. That's a win for the carceral state in terms of incorporating social workers into the work of the police. How is it that sexual assault response teams or what we call community, um, the community coordinated response, the CCR, which is very much part of camp, the, the mandates of campus responses to sexual assault, There's much more to be said there. How was that bringing together advocates and linking them together with the agendas of law enforcement in a way that hybridized and joined these movements uh, or these spheres so that we no, no longer had the kind of force of protest or the force of autonomy within our advocacy programs. But this is another way of interlinking ourselves with and getting incorporated into the carceral state. 
um, just to, to segue forward, um, some of what I found in my own historical work that I did was that many of these feminist leaders were anti-police and started out with contestation against police. At that time in the early 70s, the police did not care about sexual assault and they didn't care about domestic violence. They didn't even consider that their, sp their sphere. There was contestation to say, you have to care about this, do something, make us part of your institutional work. How did that, how did that end up? When you win, you're suddenly in collaboration with the state. So this is something that we have to think about as we move our work forward. Um, what I saw was a lot of early feminists that we won. We, have, we actually have power, we have subversive power over the state, but did we? What we found is that, um, that many uh, of these kinds of collaborations lost their feminist edge, that they became replicated. And when you replicate an institution, you do not replicate an institution. The manual doesn't say have a subversive control over this. We have to think about that when we, like, even with civilian oversight of police forces. Um, they are often replicated in ways that mask that and dilute and actually disappear that original kind of force of contestation and protest. How does this move towards our hybridizing ourselves to that we can't even tell the difference between ourselves as feminists and ourselves as part of the police or ourselves as social workers and ourselves as part of the police force or part of the um, carceral system? How does this, if we, these things get replicated, how has this become kind of an occupation of the entire field of anti-violence um, work? And how are we um, eventually subordinated to this? We thought we won, but in the end they won. And we have actually lost our identity in that um, journey. So if you wanna call this a dance, um, I would call this a carceral creep and there's many, many um, connotations to that. Uh, image. Um, I'm going to just stop there to talk a little bit more about um, how it is then, and I think I'm going to be coming to an end soon, how is it that this work um, has influence on over uh, campuses um, and that uh, you can say be aware of what you ask for. So right now we have the kind of carceral presence, you know, call 911. Um, oh, don't engage with the person who harmed you. That's too dangerous. We have to put that, give that to the police. They're the ones that can take care of that. We actually don't even know how to do that anymore. We don't have the capacity to engage people who might even be our family members, our community members, our friends in harm. This is the work of transformative justice. How do we build up those skills? How has this led to demand for inclusion of campus sexual assault? And now we have Title IX on all campuses we have faculty as mandatory reporters. And in some cases, we have separation of on-campus on interventions through Title IX and off-campus resources that might be much more amenable to things like transformative justice. And in fact, for some of us, if we even talk to a student, let's say, and tell them about another resource off-campus, that that can constitute a violation of um, protocol where we could lose our jobs. How is it that we made demands for campuses to, to care about sexual assault and ended up because that we are so much in a carceral kind of um, logic already that we immediately ended up uh, making these kind of rules that I, mean, and I asked you, are those, are those survivor centered? And we look at what's happening right now with um, the changes under DeVoe where, uh, you know, like I think we could hardly say that a lot of those strategies are, are um, survivor centered. So um, just, I'm gonna end with the, some of the work uh, again that I've been doing through creative interventions, through our, our initial work we created, um, almost like a DIY, uh, everybody's familiar with that now, um, manual to see how we could take the lessons from how we actually dealt with violence in a collective way without using law enforcement, um, at looking at conditions of violence and uh, use this in autonomous spaces. Uh, how is it that we, we have used this to skill up and to build up spaces of mutual aid? Um, I know that 
we I get emails all the time from people who said that we've, they've used this resources. It's so many that the transformative justice um, community have created for free um, to address violence among friends within their family and so on. Um, and as we have to ask ourselves, as we move to defund the police, what do these alternatives look like? How are we prepared as members of a campus community and members of communities that are off campus to do the work of self-determination and liberation? What role do campuses have to play? So my question is and has been, um, how do uh, grassroots, decentered, uh, mutual aid politics and practices and strategies that we now call transformative justice flourish in the institutions of the campus and more specifically here at Cal State Long Beach? That is a question that all of us are here to answer. And as we make demands to defund the police, how are we as a community going to be there for each other to create the world of compassion, care and integrity when, where all lives are precious that we're striving for? Um, I'm so glad that Sir Mendes is here because if this were just me talking, I'd probably end there and I am ending here. But I also know that Sir has done so much work in really reimagining campuses as a space of liberation and um, a transformative justice and has some amazing uh, practices and strategies to share. So thank you. I guess I should just pop right in, right? Yeah, okay, let's keep, let's keep this party going. Okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and share a PowerPoint off jump. Um, let's see here, because I wanna make sure we get clear, which is really an important part of transformative justice is like making sure we're all on the same page from the beginning. So hopefully folks can still see me. Um, all right, so, for me, something that becomes really important is thinking about the context, this, this demand to defund the police, right? And what are gonna be the key questions for us at the CSUs um, and for other college, college campuses in general, but you know, I'm thinking about where I'm situated. So, so some of the key questions for us is what is this call to defund and disarm? Um, what, do, what is it that we mean when we say we're abolitionists, right? Like what, what does that actually mean, not just in theory, but in practice? And what does it mean to radically reimagine quote, public safety? And I'm putting that in quotes because that's the language of the institution. That's not necessarily how I think about safety, but how do we reimagine public safety on university campuses, especially if we're gonna think about survivors? And just to be clear, when I'm talking about survivors, I'm not just thinking about survivors of sexual harm. I'm thinking about survivors in a very expansive way, right? So we're thinking about um, survivors of all types of harm, including the kinds of uh, structural harms and state harms that our students experience prior to coming to campus. And so that's some of the considerations. So in my mind, it seems really important to clarify that the calls to defund and disarm are really a tactical strategy, okay? They are a part of abolition, but they are not synonymous with abolition. Abolition is much bigger than that, right? So we just need to, as we think about it, we can think of the removal of police from our campuses as a harm reduction strategy. And that becomes really important, not just in the context of, not just in the context of the history that Araceli gave us at the beginning of this talk, which is, you know, cops have not been on our campuses for that long. To be honest, they've been on our campuses, like they just got there last week in the scheme of history. <laughs> <laughs> right? Which means we can do the work of imagining campuses without them. But it is a harm reduction strategy when we think about how militarized they've become, right? How much access to weaponry they have. And when we think about the kinds of calls that they receive, there's really no need for, for that kind of weaponry to begin with. So this call to defund and disarm really is an invitation to actually actively engage in abol 
an abolitionist philosophy, right? And part of that engagement includes beginning to reimagine how we respond to harm, right? What we think harm is. It also is an invitation to radically reimagine what we think justice is and what we think safety is. So when you hear that call, it is an invitation. It's not that there's this ready-made solution. It's an invitation for all of us to really start to imagine together. So for me, it seems really important to get clear on a, def a working definition of abolition. And so um, for starters, what abolition is not, it, it is not new, <laughs> okay? Ab we need to think of abolition as historically grounded in, you know, the uprisings of enslaved peoples, the historic struggle for black liberation. And if we think of abolition in that sort of long view, we can just get very clear that abolition didn't happen last week with these calls, right? To defund and disarm and, and, and such. Um, what it is, it is a reclamation that black life in particular is precious and that the state should not have just carte blanche right to determine who gets to live and who gets to die, right? And as we witness folks, we've witnessed in real time that happen over and over and over. We need to think of abolition in that context. So again, reiterating some of this thing around the preciousness of life, but the folks whose bodies we've been witnessing die over and over again, right? It's, it's in this long history of, of the battle for black liberation. Um, the other thing that it's not, it's not chaos and it's not illogical. I am so clear about the current administration's campaigns to frame the cause for abolition as like this movement towards chaos. You need help, you call the police and no one answers, right? That's not what abolition is about. Um, it is actually a quite justifiable response to centuries of state-sponsored violence against Black, Indigenous, and Black, Brown, Indigenous communities, right, who have experienced state violence, organized state violence in our communities over and over and over again. So abolition is a call to end that violence. The other thing that it's not, it is not about reform. And here I'm gonna talk about um, a term that Andre, that we get from Andre Gortz, which he makes a distinction between reformist reform and non-reformist reform. And we can think of, and, and other people have argued this as well, that the current police state that we have is the product of reform. So we've done reforms <laughs> within the police state. That has not necessarily minimized the kinds of violence that our communities face, right? And when we talk about reformist reforms, that's when we imagine all of the reforms within the terms of the state. So it tends to be conservative, right? It's like when we say, a perfect example of that right now on our campuses is when everyone's doubling and tripling down on reforming Title IX. Well, the more we reform Title IX, the harder it becomes to move towards something like transformative justice, or the harder it becomes to expand the, the justice options for survivors. So we're not looking for reforms that are within the terms of the state, but we are looking for non-reformist reforms. So some kinds of transformations that make the violence of the state um, and violent state forces obsolete. So what does that mean? That means moving towards a world where we can actually imagine or a campus where we can imagine police no longer on it, right? And even moving towards that imagination requires the kinds of transformations that we're not going to get if we're only thinking within the terms that we've inherited through the institution, right? 
So it really means thinking outside the box. The other thing that abolition is not is that it's not reducible to just dismantling. And you know, a lot of our imagination, it's easier for us to step into a position that is about get rid of this thing, stop this thing. The harder thing to do is to create the kinds of institutions that we need to address the unmet needs that are produced by that violence, right? So rather than just thinking in the negative, the removal, the absence of something, we want to start thinking about abolition as a move towards building life-affirming institutions, building life-affirming spaces, sort of in, in, in line with uh, Ruth Wilson Gil Gilmore's call to, to have presence instead of just absence. Okay, so what does that have to do with survivors, <laughs> right? That's the question. For me, it is so important to talk about survivors because survivors have become the justification for the expansion of policing and the doubling and tripling down on criminal justice system. Every time, like if we think his, like it, we think of the Violence Against Women Act, for instance, right? All of these movements that are in the name of protecting women, protecting queer folks, protecting all these variously situated survivors have often turned to the policing state for protection, right? So we want to think about transformative justice responses to survivors so that they can no longer use survivors as the excuse. It also matters because there has been an eruption of Me Too cases on campuses. And for me, part of why this specifically matters is because the way campuses approach the question of sexual assault, it has always been to sort of imagine that the people causing harm are students and they're causing harm to other students. So there's this assumption, right? That, that the faculty and staff administrators somehow we're like outside of this thing and we're gonna be you know, well-versed to response. Well, it turns out, and I'm putting up this picture of Larry Nasser because Larry Nasser was a, a associate professor and um, a doctor at Michigan State University who ended up harming over 500 survivors, many of which were, were underage. They were ch children at the time of his, his assault. And so, yes, we could turn to to a policing approach, but what we end up with, oh, sorry, I, I didn't mean to put that slide up, is we end up an enormous amount of resources spent on legal cases that detract from survivor needs. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. The other reason why this is important is because I think it's totally ironic <laughs> that Title IX kind of centers this language of consent and then creates the conditions where all of these faculty members are non-consensual mandated reporters. <laughs> like, no one asked me if I wanted to be a mandated reporter. And the reason for that non-consensual arrangement has to do with the fact that the institution is more concerned with litigation and compliance than they are with survivors. And the fact that they're not taking into account that not all survivors actually want a criminal justice response. And there are very good reasons why a survivor might not want that. I mean, when we think about the long history, and this is where the an expansive conception of survivorhood or survivorship matters, is that if you come from a, from a community that's systematically under assault, you don't necessarily wanna expose yourself to a criminal justice response. You don't trust that that criminal justice response can hold you, and for very good reasons. It's not imagined. Um, if you are coming from a community where papers are, you, you're undocumented, again, there's a lot of good reasons why a, a range of survivors 
would not want to be in deep um, relation or engaged at all with a, a criminal justice response. And then the last thing is this thing that criminal justice claims to be survivor centered, but all of the resources are focused on the person who caused harm. So all of the money, all of the litigation is spent on trying to figure out who's to blame for this thing, instead of funneling those resources towards healing. Um, and the other thing that it does is that it, it, it creates a predetermined definition of justice. So justice is only served when that person goes to jail. Um, forget whatever comes the ripple effect of harm that comes from the actions afterwards, right? This person goes to jail, justice is served, you should feel great. <laughs> and so it doesn't really address survivor needs. Okay, so then this brings us to this question and I hope I'm moving at an okay pace and not too fast. Um, okay, thumbs up. It feels really important to get clear on what transformative justice is and what it is not. Um, and so what I've put together here come from very definitions coming from Generation 5, the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective, Mariam Kaba and Project Nia, the work that Mimi has done in creative interventions, Insight and Philly Stands Up. So a lot of people have been part of this project for a long time. And the reason folks have come to this is because they come from communities under assault, right? So this idea of defund the police is not new for communities that have been historically under assault. And so what one thing that is important to recognize is that I would consider transformative justice a philosophy, an ethic, and a framework to address harm and violence outside of violent state systems. And here, that is not reducible to just police. That includes ICE, that includes child protective services that rip families apart, that includes versions of social work that operate as surveillance. All of those state systems, which in the name of protecting people have caused harm. Um, what it is not, it is not the answer to all harm, okay? And what I mean by that is that when we approach harm through transformative justice, we really need to assess whether or not we have the conditions to intervene in that way. And I say that to say that sometimes we move in a way that we want to address the harm, but we haven't done the work to, to create the conditions for accountability. So we have to be thoughtful, and this is why it's a long-term approach as opposed to a quick fix. And so most people think of transformative justice as a, as a replacement to the criminal justice system, right? And so I wanna make sure that folks understand that this is not mimicking a punitive approach, right? Transformative justice is really asking completely different kinds of questions, right? It's not like, oh, we're gonna just do a different kind of judge and jury type of approach. Um, so that feels important to sort of name. Instead, what it is, is it, it includes a series of practices, a series of creative interventions, and a series of pathways towards transformation that seek to address harm at the root. And what do I mean by that? I mean, like, for one, as an example, it could include something like a facilitated discussion. It could include that, but all facilitated discussions are not necessarily transformative, right? So you have to think about how these practices play out. It could include things like building up relationships, right? Pod mapping uh, from the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective, right? It could include those things, um, but it's not any one of those things. And it could include a process, right? So if someone causes harm, you could enter into a process with others to address that instance of harm 
moving forward, but it's not reducible to just the process. So we wanna think expansively about what transformative justice is and how it can look. And so it's not as simple as quote unquote, put a circle on it. Many people who are familiar with restorative justice will be like, oh, we sat in a circle and discussed this thing. And yeah, maybe we had a good outcome. So that's transformative justice. So in some cases, maybe the circle can work in a transformative fashion, but just the fact of sitting in a circle to discuss something is not transformative justice. So I just want us to be a little bit more nuanced in how we approach what we think this thing is. Um, it's important to understand that it's not about individual justice. And I think the criminal justice reduces everything to two actors, right? This person caused harm against this person. And so it's trying to intervene in just these, in these two folks. Um, however, transformative justice really is both individual and collective, right? It is about neighbors, friends, families, comrades, really working together to figure out how to make things right or to create justice together, right? And we can think about how that might play out on our campuses with faculty, staff, students, instead of having the situation where it's always students, you know, protesting and then faculty scrambling to, you know, urgently produce something that looks like it's moving in the right direction, but they, they don't necessarily have a root in trying to figure out what, what is actually the problem there. They just trying to respond to appease student demands. And so we wanna really think about what, what it would mean to transform our institutions at the root. And I, I like to use <laughs> Mimi's thing. It's not about a carceral creep. And what I mean when I say that is, when there's a lot of injustice, we tend to ca make calls for accountability that are punitive in, our, in their approach. We lean into power when we see nothing is happening. And I think the transformative justice is asking us to really rethink that approach um, and to, to move towards an abolitionist vision that actually centers survivor needs. Okay. So what are some very, um, so these are survivor-centered goals that are, that are TJ survivor-centered goals. There's four key areas that we have to think of when we're talking about transformative justice. One is the survivor. What does the survivor need? How can we create survivor safety, dignity, agency, and belonging? So how can a survivor have say over what they think justice is. How can we create the conditions where a survivor is not isolated when they come forward to talk about harm they've experienced? And you know, the current processes often isolate survivors because in the name of protection, we'll take them out of classes and all of a sudden they're alone, right? And we don't wanna do that. The second thing is that we're thinking about the person who caused harm. How do we create pathways for transformation for, for the person who caused harm? Our standard approach is to fire the person or expel the person, and that's fine. But let's be clear that that's a Band-Aid approach. What we're doing in that move is we're basically just exporting the problem to someone else's neighborhood. And yeah, that solves the problem in the immediate, but the truth of the matter is it leaves the institution untouched. It presumes that the problem lies with just the person causing harm. And that's not what TJ says. TJ says that part three, there's a community responsibility. And so we have to figure out how is it, what is the community responsibility? And for anyone who's, who's sat in a faculty meeting or who's been in these meetings where some something pops off and everyone stays quiet, you know full well that there's been instances of, of harm that a community could have intervened in and don't. So TJ calls that out. And then the last thing that TJ does is says, what are the structural conditions that enable the harm to happen? And here, we're not just looking at individuals acting in a space, we're looking at 
policies, procedures, all types of practices on our campuses that actually enable harm. Okay, so what does that look like in practice if we were gonna do it on our campus? And I, I, I know I just wanna do a little time check. I have like two more slides. So if y'all can hang with me, we'll get to the nitty gritty because I wanna, I wanna give you some recommendations. So what does it look like in practice? Number one, we got to assess our institutions, right? We got to look at how our policies and practices and procedures are enabling harmful power dynamics and behaviors on our campus. And we can talk in the Q&A about what that looks like. Um, but we can see those play out through tenure processes, um, you know, power moves between faculty and students, all types of, of practices. Um, on our campuses. The other thing is we gotta recognize that punitive approaches are actually just unsustainable, right? Every time we make a demand for punishment, we're actually asking faculty, staff, and others to become cops. And I don't wanna become a cop. What I wanna do is I wanna figure out if there's opportunities for us to create the conditions for people to volunteer into accountability. And that may mean us building up our conflict resolution skill sets and building up conflict resolution models in our departments, in our spaces, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we don't have to like turn and become cops to, to, to resolve conflicts amongst us. The other thing we can do is identify practices that actually thicken our relationships to each other. Like, I can't even tell you how many times, I, I know campuses are toxic spaces. So how do we create support networks? How do we create accountability networks with each other, right? So we can intervene when we see things popping off. Um, another thing for me is that uh, instead of building up our relationships, institutions demand trust without earning it. So I would say we can build up our relationships to each other by taking an earn trust approach, which means we have to show up consistently over time to earn the trust that we demand. Um, I think we can identify pathways for transformation and that includes doing that for very for common harms. How many times have we sat in spaces where microaggressions are popping off and we don't have a way to transform that behavior? We just call it out, but there's no actual path to address it. We can do that. And then, you know, folks always talk about hurt people, hurt people. <laughs> there's a lot of hurt people on our campuses, tell you what. And so, <laughs> Um, you know, we can start doing the work of healing those relationships as a preventative strategy that actually expand the bandwidth for when crisis actually pops off. Because that's the other thing that we don't have the bandwidth because we're too busy fighting with each other, that when, when there's a real crisis on hand, no one has the energy to deal with it because we're all hurt. Um, and then last but not least, we have to become survivor centered. And I'm just gonna give you a handful of concrete recommendations for how that can look on our campuses and, and, and I'm done. So for me, there's some strategic interventions that are about detangling ourselves from a carceral logic and a carceral approach. And the first thing we can do when it comes to sexual assault is we can expand the confidential, confidentiality sites on our campus so that all of the resources that survivors can access should not be attached to reporting and we should be advocating for no mandated reporting. That, that opens up a space for us to say, okay, it shouldn't be that we, we are only able to address survivor needs under duress <laughs> through mandated reporting. So let's expand our confidentiality sites. Let's redirect monies to expanding justice and healing options for survivors. And what I mean by that is universities, a lot, most universities have a nice little chunk of money that they reserve for mediation, to outsource to these lawyers who are like reviewing these Title IX cases. That money should be redirected at you know, creating 
transformative justice alter, you know, spaces for survivors who don't wanna go that route. Um, the other thing is that we should be resourcing and skilling up local and internal facilitators. And what I mean by that is folks who are versed in, again, uh, addressing the root of harm within our institutions instead of like paying mediators to come in and, you know, sort of enact a very lawyer-esque <laughs> approach. Um, we can be looking at the gray cases. What do I mean by the gray cases? Well, right now, Title IX, if, if, if a case gets sent to Title IX and it comes back, no finding, which by the way, happens very often, which is that some harm went down, some sexual harm went down, but it didn't rise to the level of a, of a legal violation. It comes back, no finding. And then everybody's like, great. I didn't, like the person who caused harm is like, great. I didn't do nothing because Title IX found no finding, right? So we could start looking at those cases and start thinking about how do we heal those harms? Because just because no finding came back doesn't mean that nothing happened, right? And so we have to address that harm in the space. And we can do that without being in violation of Title IX because Title IX took their shot and they, it came back no finding. Um, the other thing we could be doing is resourcing community partners who end up supporting survivors that we fail. So when they, when we don't show up, survivors tend to go to community partners outside of the institution, and they're basically picking up the economic, you know, the, the resource. <laughs> they're like doing the work on un, unsupported. And then last but not least, we can think about deans versus students. Like we need to get clear about how these different Entities and communities have different kinds of capacities, right? So instead of ignoring that fact, we could say deans have the capacity to mobilize resources in any in specific directions. We can push them to do that. Students can advocate and, and create a kind of like a call that say other members in the institution can't. So let's get clear about our capacities and work with that. So that's it for me. I'm going to shut it here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sir Sis and, and Mimi. Um, both of your talks were gave us a lot to, to think about. They're really wonderful. And I think that this is a really great this is going to be a really great resource. Um, some uh, folks in the uh, um, in the Q&A are asking of the video is going to be available once the link is available we are going to share that with the those who signed up for the for the webinar and um the other um thing missy uh suggested is that maybe we can also share the resources and articles that were some of the resources and articles that were mentioned the the resources that mimi wanted to share for instance um so we do have a couple of questions. If anyone wants to add more questions to the Q and A, you can um, look at the bottom of your screen. So sort of put your cursor over the <laughs> the speaker view, and um, a um, option for Q and A should pop up on your screen, and so you can type your questions in there. Um, I'm gonna um, start with Anita Tijerina Revilla's question, um, or I guess call. <laughs> she she hasn't asked. Can you, um, can the presenters please share accountability models or resources with us um, if possible? So I'll leave it, I'll leave it up to you. Um, yeah, um, I actually on the PowerPoint slide, I, I had a few, I'm not, I'm, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna share it right now because I think what we can do is come up with a list. I mean, what we have right now is a buildup of a lot of resources. Most of them are free. Um, that are everything from toolkits to websites. Um, what a really great resource that came out recently is um, a set of mixed, it's called mixtape, um, of a, a lot of different webinars that were specifically constructed to form like various angles on the issue of abolition and transformative justice. There's abolition toolkits. There's a giant, uh, almost overwhelming, I think, site called Transform Harm. Dot org, which has just a lot of um, archived products, some of which were uh, 
made a while ago, but that are still very, very relevant in terms of their application today. So what we can do is um, put, I, I thought that we'd be able to put things in a chat. We don't have that capacity right now, but sources, I think that we could make a list and um, that can be sent out to this group of viewers. And I would say that there's also uh, texts that have been written toolkits like um, uh, Shira Hassan and Miriam Kaba, <laughs> Bumping Towards Repair, the Creative Interventions Toolkit, which is like the TJ Bible. Uh, okay. <laughs> like you can finally you know, purchase like, yeah. 100 pages. You know what I'm saying? So if you got time and it's energy, you can pull stuff out. Great. Yep, Fumbling Towards Repair. There's there's a lot of um, stuff out there that has, there's been an eruption of, of, of materials. I would say that also there's, there's a lot of tools that can be found in things that have been written about restorative justice. I think the one thing that we, I just would like to emphasize is that folks often conflate restorative justice with transformative justice and the way restorative justice has been practiced within the context of the United States that feels really important to name is that there has been a kind of collaboration with, um, with state systems, right? So we'll have, we'll see restorative justice options um, as tied to a diversion program for, for folks who, who have been caught up in, in the system. And so while I do not see restorative justice and transformative justice as mutually exclusive, I'm clear that transformative justice is abolitionist. So it isn't trying to collaborate with state systems. And so when I think about TJ on our campuses, I call it TJ-esque which is it's aspiring towards operating, but as long as we're in an institution that is embedded with, with police and these systems, it, it can't be transformative justice. Um, so for me, TJ is, is placed as, as something to aspire towards, right? Yeah. yeah, and I just want to add with that too is that um, because restore, you know, there's a, such a call for restorative justice, transformative justice right now, there is a real caution, uh, um, as Sersa said, around just the wholesale use of the word restorative justice, thinking that that means everything beautiful and everything we want. You really have to look at the particularities of how that's being institutionalized. And so much of it has been um, just assumed that law enforcement would be involved. Oftentimes it's actually started by law enforcement. Um, right now I'm doing a pilot project um, in Contra Costa County, we're in Richmond, California, where we are putting together organizations to, we're piloting a restorative justice program for domestic violence and sexual violence. We are calling it restorative justice because um, many of the organizations, they don't, they're not wholesale buying into abolition or transformative justice, but they are buying into the need for a non-law enforcement option. And one that uses all of these kind of principles we've been talking about, collective strategies, um, leveraging compassion and care, uh, working towards transformation of people who have caused harm without using punishment is completely law, uh, outside of law enforcement. Um, and because we're in pilot stages, you know, I think by next year we'll have our findings that we feel comfortable to put out, but it's, it is an exciting project. And I see it's kind of in that, a little bit of a gray area um, and moving away from carceral creep and towards um, a non-carceral, uh, set of solutions. Um, thank you so much. We have a few questions in the audience that are um, uh, focused on how do you respond to pushback? So I'm gonna, um, I'm framing the, the set of questions this way. It's uh, four questions and thank you for those who pose the questions. I pulled them out of the chat for, so that I could post them in a clear manner. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna share them. Uh, one of the main pushbacks I hear when I talk about abolition on campus is about the rise of domestic terrorism and gun violence. What are rebuttals for this kind of fear? Uh, um, how, the second question, how, how would you go about explaining what defunding the police represents to those who are against defunding the police because they believe it means abolishing them? Uh, the third question, how can off-campus organizations that support survivors who have close relationships with the police work towards distancing themselves to push towards the defunding and abolition of the police. 
Uh, and the fourth question, in reaching toward transformative justice, how would we respond to survivors of violence who themselves demand a carceral punishment, demand carceral punishment for the person who caused harm? Those are, again, I think that those are all related. <laughs> Focus on, on pushback, right? Which I think because um, carceral systems are so normalized within our society that often is pushback. Yeah. Um, before we jump into this set of questions, I'm going to propose something and we can, I think that these, this Q&A type of thing, we may need to have a whole nother second session, <laughs> just Q&A, because a lot of the questions, there's going to be a lot of questions and there's a lot of nuance in all four of those questions. So I just wanted to name that as an, as an option for future, but Mimi, would you like to go first? Oh, um, wow. Those are four huge questions. Okay. I'm going to start the last and I'm not even. Well, I will introduce this by saying some of us have been doing this for 20 years. If you don't know that we had pushback, I mean, it's been pushed back all the way. Um, you, and one, you know, with all of organizing, you have to find your like-minded people to build relationship with. This is what's happening, I think, with the CSU Abolition Network. This is what's happening with the, the um, Long Beach um, chapter of that. That's, this is happening, I think, among many of you who are listening, who have your little groups of people that you know, start looking at all, all the materials that are available right now. These are really important questions. I think with the question around what if survivors want a carceral um, response? I mean, I can just say from my own work that I did with creative interventions and I do now, that is very common. And it's not always a carceral response, meaning like I want to call the cops. Sometimes it's like, I want something bad to happen to this person. They hurt me. Um, do something, you know, everything from take a baseball bat, which is something that some people call that transformative justice. Now I don't, but there are people that are calling something like that um, transformative justice to anything from that, you know, banning as, as um, Circe has talked about. So this is not to say that there aren't cases in which asking somebody to leave a space is actually something that's a strategy that's important for the harm to stop. And that is not only for the benefit of the survivor, it is for the benefit of the person who caused harm mm -hmm. to remove themselves from the conditions where they have habitually caused harm. How do, the thing is we just do that without actually providing the kind of support to hold that person um, and I don't mean hold like this, I mean hold like this, um, with the kinds of shame uh, responses, the, the, the excuse making, the blaming that are just inherent with probably any of us when we're called out on something we did that somebody found harmful and you know more so with certain people and others. So um, we have to create the, those conditions. And what I've seen in my own work is if you give people space to imagine that such a thing is possible, so many people will want that. So many survivors who feel so much anger, who want something bad to happen because they can't imagine something good happening because we don't have a world right now where we see many examples of that. What we're trying to build in this imagination, and not just imagination, but practice, is more and more spaces where survivors can feel like I'm in a community that I feel is gonna keep me safe and is actually going to take this person and I don't have to do that work, but there is a community and a collective group that's going to do that work towards transformation because ultimately I don't want that person to hurt somebody else. I don't want them to hurt me either. We, we're building that muscle. We're building that kind of political conceptual space. I mean, one that has been in existence for centuries, you know, so this is not new. It's new for us in 2020 because we've been so occupied by kind of this carceral, you know, we have to have the cops, that it's really it's taking work of extricating people from that and building um, responses that show, yes, this is possible. So I, for right now, for the very immediate, if somebody calls the police because they don't have their transformative justice 911 right now set up, I don't think we're in a position and for what I know is most of the people I know who are practitioners of trans transformative justice are not gonna shame somebody for those kinds of strategies. We'll say we cannot be in a position of shaming somebody for picking strategies when we have not developed the kind of infrastructure to have transformative justice possible. But our work is to create a, this 
um, this kind of politic philosophy and actual practices that make that um, possible. The other thing is those of us doing transformative justice have gotten almost no money. We have had billions and billions, probably trillions of dollars going to a law enforcement response. And we have had almost no money. So when people are very critical and that's happening of transformative justice, it is, we, we're doing this practice, most of us, it's our political work is for free. And it's, you know, and people are just leaving these, these toolkits are like labors of love and they're huge amounts of energy. And most of us are putting it out for free. We are, we are not get, given billions of dollars. And yet, as we know, um, for struggles that have succeeded over the centuries, that that's how we start. We start small, we start grassroots, and we are creative as hell, right? And, um, and we have to rely on each other to be creative, innovative, and strategic. Yeah. Surface. And, and, and I would say, I would say, look, um, I'm not going to tell a survivor what they should or shouldn't do. I, I, I'm not going to do that. What I am going to say is that if a survivor moves towards something punitive, I'll just say that's not an accident, right? Because we've all been trained in a very carceral imagination and we haven't been given other options. However, I would say if we're thinking long-term, long game, and I think, okay, yeah, so we send this person to jail, great. Um, do we think that this person is gonna become less harmful in jail, in prison? Do we think that? Do we honestly think that? And when, when we've seen folks go to prison for things like sexual harm, to me, it's no accident that um, when they're about to get out, a survivor will, will, will start to get very nervous about who's coming out of that prison. Because in all that time, they have no idea what that person has been working on in terms of their transformation. And truth be told, if you're in a situation that is violent, you're not going to be thinking about the harm you cause someone else. I'm not saying that people have not experienced some type of transformation in prison. There are some people who have, but the conditions are not really there for transformation. That's not the intention of the prison. So because that's not the intention of the prison, why would we expect less harmful people to emerge out of that system? It makes no sense. And they're doing it with the lion's share of the resources. So here we are, the lion's share of the money is going towards a system that's not producing less harmful people. And for the amount of money that has been spent in that system, we should have way better results. And yet when folks come and, and ask and ask questions about transformative justice, they make demands that they do not make of the criminal justice system, right? Which is what way more resourced. So that's one of the arguments for me, which is like, hey, what kinds of demands are you making? You're not getting those results from the criminal justice system and that's where all the money's going. So. That's number one. Number two, when we talk about this, and I, I kind of want to get to this thing about the domestic terrorism, which I think, I think it's a really powerful question. I think there's a couple things involved there. One thing that feels important to me is that we don't yet have the conditions to respond to all types of harm. And that's why I said, you know, this thing is not, transformative justice isn't a, a panacea for all things. Um, I think it's an approach that can inform how we think about harm. And in, that, and in that particular instance, the question that emerges for me is, what are the unmet needs of the person enacting domestic terrorism? What, what are the unmet needs there? What is it that takes a person to, to, to enact that type of violence? Clearly, we, if we start thinking about how to address unmet needs, right? We would have less instances of harm. And that's where the ethic and the framework becomes a useful way to think about how we move towards less harmful, harmful circumstances. I think in the immediacy, do we have people who are willing to put their bodies between someone who's wielding a gun or not? That's, that's the kind of question. Do we have people skilled in de-escalation as opposed to escalation? 
right? And I, you know, oftentimes you call someone out who's also armed to the teeth, someone's gonna get shot, right? So what are, what, how are we, for me, there's a question here about how we can use the institution to start to skill people up in terms of conflict resolution, identifying unmet needs, and moving towards the, those kinds of projects as opposed to always responding, always thinking in terms of the worst case extreme scenario and organizing all of our justice imagination around those kinds of extremes. Because when we think about what are people's biggest oppositions to moving away from police, it's always murderers and rapists. But do they really constitute the large majority of the people in prison? They don't. They are not the biggest numbers. So why is all of our imagination around justice around those cases? Let's start really sort of expanding how we think about harm. And in this case, do we have the conditions yet to have someone uh, talk some, you know, an active shooter off campus? No, we don't. But I think that part of the issue there is that because we can't imagine a world without police, we haven't even begun to do the thinking on that question. Instead, we're just reacting to the potential of it, which keeps us from, from starting the work of saying, okay, let's remove the cops and see all of the ways in which police have become a crutch to all types of social problems. Yeah, and then there's the use of fear and anxiety to say, well, we're not even gonna go there. We're not even gonna build a small program. We're not gonna do anything. We're just gonna say no. And that, that has happened for years in the anti-violence movement. It's starting to change. Um, what are the possibilities? I know one of the questions was when, when an organization or institution or a set of organizations is so embedded with the police. Um, there are a couple of examples, and I'm sad to say there aren't very many, that are starting to extricate for themselves from that within like an arm of their program, a, per, a particular, to build up that muscle, to figure out what that looks like in terms of shaping a different kind of, of you know, uh, direct service delivery system or whatever that there, there has been small work being done. There are some examples of, uh, I think Cure Global has some really interesting, successful examples of programs that use interrupters to actually interrupt gun violence. But these programs that operate with a neoliberal kind of condition where you have to fight for publicity to get your grant money and you get your grant money for three years, you do a beautiful project and I've seen this happen over and over again. A project that actually works, but you're not gonna get any funding anymore, it's not new. Oh, you did that already, I don't wanna fund that. And mm -hmm. I have seen actual beautiful programs get started, flourish, and get shut down because of this kind of funding, capitalist funding system that we have. When are, we have to actually change the structural conditions, as we all say, um, because we have had some successes, but they do not prevail. They get shut down or allowed to just disappear. I actually want to say one thing about this question around accountability that I, I, I want us to also start thinking about is that there's a lot of demands for people to, you know, like there's demands to hold others accountable. And I think one thing that feels really important as a part of transformative justice is how do we start to practice our own self accountability? Because when you start doing that work on small scale stuff, you realize the extent of the demand that you're making on others to step into something around responsibility. It is not an easy thing to, to, to take accountability. Um, and so how, how can we start to build up support networks to, to, to be able to, to transform behavior that we know is harmful, right? Um, and we have to we have to practice that each and every one of us have to practice that daily so that we can start to appreciate what that work actually is. Unfortunately, we are now out of time. We have some really great <laughs> questions in the in the Q&A, but um, we're not going to be able to get to them today as Cersei uh, said, we usually need more uh, like in the after. <laughs> 
<laughs> after the panel debriefing, right? <laughs> um, thank you all for attending today. Again, the video will be available um, uh, soon and we'll share that link and um, maybe the resource list that um, Mimi, Mimi and Sources might work on um, at, a, at a later time. Um, thank you all again. Uh, and we hope to see you again soon. Uh, Missy, were you gonna, are you popping in to say something? No, just thank you oh. for everything. And um, if you want to send any of your resources <coughs> to me, I can make sure that they're compiled. I have the questions. Oh. You. So any questions you want to answer? I took a screenshot of all the question unanswered questions. So um, that's what I was going to say. And if folks have further questions, is there a place that they can send those questions to? Because then we could maybe set up a second round with just Q&A. Well, for now, you can send them. I, I will be I'm happy to compile them. Um, and my email address is my first name, Melissa dot Maseko, as on my Zoom window. Uh, at csulb.edu. Thank you, Missy. Okay, well, I, I think with that, we can uh, say goodbye and, and um, just to respect everyone's time. <laughs> and uh, again, thank you all for being here and especially to Mimi and uh, to Cersei for, for um, sharing their knowledge and years of um, activism with us today. Uh, thank you so much. It's just the beginning, y'all. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye.